So this story began for me about 10 years ago. I was a senior level manager with a large multinational corporation, and I was working on developing sustainable business strategies. And we were charged with how to come up with it. And, and the term at the time was even more of an abstraction than it is today. Few of us understood what the word meant, and even fewer of us were building business strategies around it. And the interesting thing is it's not as if the word was new or is new. Back in the late 60s, the Club of Rome had given us the idea of sustainability as a concept. And then in 1987, a UN commission gave the term the definition that goes something like this. Sustainability is the ability to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Now, armed with that definition, I worked for a company that lived by the bottom line, the single bottom line, right? And so the, my bosses would come up to me and they would ask me on a regular basis, you know, Mike, how are we going to make money on sustainability? And I pondered this question and thought about it. And one night, as I'm sure all of us do in this age, I was searching the web for answers. And I came across a, an initiative out of Georgetown University, a Jesuit initiative called the Woodstock Business Conference. And as I read the material on this page, I had an epiphany, an insight opened up for me. And I realized that business isn't just about profits. In fact, it's about so much more. Yet if we don't take the time to think about it and consider this stuff, we will not understand that. Now, if you buy into the notion that we need to become sustainable by the definition, if we buy into the notion that business is more than simply profitability, then we might ask ourselves a few questions, such as, why don't we just export our way of life to the rest of the planet? So before we even begin to answer that question, consider this. At 300 million people in this country, we comprise 4% of the world's population. Yet we consume more than 25% of the world's output of energy. So science says, which is a pesky place where alternative facts don't exist, that it, we're not capable of doing this, right? That's kind of what the science says. So if you buy into the science, and if you buy into the notion that business is more than simply profitability, and if you buy into the notion that we need to become sustainable, then what are we to do? Well, I would suggest that what we need in this age is a new philosophy for business. And some of you out there might say, well, you know what, Mike, I get it, but philosophy and business don't go together. I disagree. Each one of us gets out of bed every day with a worldview or a philosophy about life. And the, truth is, and, the, and the fact is, this is true of corporations as well, and business and generally how we look at the world. So what I would suggest is what we have is an opportunity to borrow on the tremendous wealth of philosophical traditions that emerge from our culture, Western philosophical traditions. And that we need to look at that and borrow on the rich heritage that we have there, the very heritage that gives us the country in which we live and the way we look at the world as Americans. So well, let's just do that for a bit. Let's travel back 2,500 years, back to the time of Socrates. Now, Socrates was an interesting sort of guy. He would walk around the streets of Athens, and he would come up to people and ask them, why do you think the way that you do? What does the term justice mean to you? And he was trying to get people to think a bit more differently about how they looked at the world. And of course, Socrates taught Plato, who in turn taught Aristotle. And herein we have the tripartite of Western philosophical traditions. Now, this etching here is a depiction of one of the stories that Plato gives us. And it's called the Allegory of the Cave. And in this picture, or in the story, Prisoners are inside a cave, and they're chained in such a way that the only thing that they can see are shadows on a wall. The only thing that they can hear are, are, are echoes and whispers. In fact, their entire lives are illusions. And Plato suggested that many of us go through life in the same way. We live in sort of an illusion of what reality is. I would submit to you that our illusion in this age is framed by incessant advertising. Advertising that tells us that the way to happiness is through consumption, that if we have more stuff, we will be happier, that we buy the bigger car, we'll be happier, if we remodel a house, we'll be happier, and so forth and so on. This is an illusion. Now, let's fast forward to the uh, 18th century and the philosopher William Friedrich Hegel. Hegel said that 
the way we look at the world is something that goes like this. We all sort of share a dominant view of the world. He called that the thesis. Then he said that there are small groups of us who share a less than dominant view, an emergent view of the world. He called that the antithesis. He said that it's, we're always in a tension between the thesis and the antithesis, and what emerges from that is the synthesis. Eventually, the synthesis becomes the dominant way of seeing the world, and we progress throughout human history, advancing, hopefully, to a greater level of civilization. Our thesis, the way we see the world in this country, primarily especially when it has to do with business and markets and how those sorts of things function, is given to us by this gentleman here. He's an 18th century fellow. His name is Adam Smith. When Adam Smith looked out his front door, he saw a world controlled primarily by the crown. In fact, if you were born at the lower rungs of the socioeconomic ladder, your chances of going up were about as close to zero as one could imagine. And what he said was, we need to liberalize things. We need to open things up a little bit more and allow people to move up the socioeconomic ladder. If you think about it back then, if you wanted to start a business back in Smith's day, you would have to petition the crown to charter your business. Businesses were chartered by the crown. That was the only way you could start it. So he gives us the way we see the world today, which is the free market, primarily. Well, obviously, others contributed to that. But now, if you fast forward toward the end of the 19th century, and you imagine yourself in London, England, and you're walking around the streets of London and the coal mining industry, and you notice that there are children working in the coal mines, and maybe you'll run into characters like Dickens, Ebenezer, Scrooge, not very nice people, right? And then you might begin to understand what so enraged Karl Marx about unbridled capitalism. The trouble is, in our age, though, if you long for the good old days, what you'll do is you'll quote Smith ad infinitum. You'll talk about how the visible hand of the market is going to somehow lift up humanity and make the world a much better place. The trouble with this is, is that actually a co-opted reading of Smith's works. Smith wrote two very important books. One's called Moral Sentiments, and the other's called Wealth of Nations. Now, if you're a one percenter and you think that all of existence is driven by profitability, you skip moral sentiments and jump right to the wealth of nations. And ergo, we have what is called neoliberalism. And the narrative for neoliberalism goes something like this. Government is wrong. Government is the problem. Regulations are the problem. We need to get go government out of business. And oh, by the way, the only people in government ought to be people who run businesses because government ought to be run by a business. That's the narrative. Now, I'm not sure about you, but when I look at thoughtful government and thoughtful policy, I am very thankful for it, especially when it comes to things like child labor laws. Now, emergent from our infatuation with capitalism are a couple of paradigms I'd like to talk about right now. One is called consumerism, and the other is called the shareholder value model. Now, consumerism as a way of thinking is framed primarily by a couple of principles when it emerged back in the early part of the 20th century. They, they are that Earth has an unlimited abundance of materials from which we can make stuff. And the second is a little limerick. The solution to pollution is dilution. If you remember, I was taught that years and years ago, and that is obviously, many of us are laughing, and that's not true. But let's break down consumerism and look at it a little bit more carefully. Consumerism begins, well, let me, I'll give you the definition of it first before we go here. So consumerism is defined as the notion that ever-increasing consumption of goods leads to a healthy and vibrant economy. Ever-increasing consumption. That's the definition. So it begins something like this. We extract materials and that sort of thing from the earth, chemistries, steel, metal, and all, not steel, but the uh, minerals and so forth that we produce stuff with, which takes a lot of energy in the form of fossilized fuels, highly concentrated energy in the form of fossilized fuels. The next step is the refinement and the production of the stuff that we use. So we take the minerals and raw materials and turn them into the product, the, the building blocks of what we're going to produce, such as automobiles and TV sets and refrigerators and so forth. And then, because the system demands ever-increasing consumption, we essentially get rid of what we have to make room for the new and improved version of essentially the same thing. And so 
this is what we wind up with. We throw it away at the end. We call this as a very simple linear model, take, make, waste. Now the problem with it is, it is that it's predicated on three assumptions that are patently incorrect. The first of which is that there is a limitless supply of materials in the Earth's crust. The second of which is that there is a limitless supply of highly concentrated energy in the form of fossil fuels. And finally, and the most importantly, that Earth can absorb all the garbage that we put into it. All three of those are patently incorrect. Now we'll move on to the next one. This is the Chicago School of Economics and its favorite son, Mr. Milton Friedman. And he gives us the notion that the purpose of business is to maximize shareholder value. He wrote an article in the New York Times in 1970 where he put forth this idea. And it has taken nearly 50 years, but finally educators and business leaders are waking up to the notion that this is one of the most bankrupt ideas ever to hit humanity. In fact, in the latter part of the 1970s, while he was the president at Quaker Oats, Kevin Mason is quoted as saying, maximizing shareholder value is no more the purpose of business than eating is the purpose of life. One would hope that life is a little bit more challenging and broader than simply eating. Of course, the problem with this idea is that it's this greed make good idea is that it has caused untold human suffering. It has led to the justification for globalization and literally the frenetic acceleration of consumerism. The problem, of course, with these two paradigms is that they are simple, linear paradigms that purport to explain things as complex as human nature itself and nature. And of course, that, they don't work very well for that. There isn't any time right now to get into all of the peer-reviewed and validated science that is telling us overwhelmingly that our behavior is having a negative and significant negative impact on the environment. And it's not just climate change. It's everything that we do, from industrialized agriculture to the pharmaceuticals we flush down the toilet daily. Everything that we're doing under the consumerist model is having a negative effect on the environment. In fact, in August of last year, geologists took another significant step toward calling this age the Anthropocene, which means that if geologists are around millennia from now to study the fossilized record of this age, they will see that we had a significant impact on it. And to me, that is one of the most telling examples of how significant our behavior is on the environment and what it's doing to it. You know, just to put this into context and give it some scale, back in the latter part of the 60s and the early 70s when we saw the first images of Earth from space from the Apollo missions, we began to realize just how remote we are in space and how fragile this system is. What we see from space is an 11.3 mile thick veil that covers Earth akin to a wrapping a basketball with cellophane. And within that thin veil, all of life is contained. It took 4.5 billion years for this to emerge. And for us, as modern human beings, we've only been here for about 120,000 years. And in the last roughly 300 years, we've begun to threaten the stability of this system because of our behavior. At the core of our behavior is the hubris the likes of which have never before been seen. And the way we see things, we look past the complex mystery of life. We see Earth not so much as an interrelated web of life and existence infused with spirit, but rather as a machine, the purpose of which is to generate money. Our way of seeing the world denies what Plato taught us, denies what he said was most important, and that is it's not the material. It isn't the sensate. It isn't the commodification of all things, but rather the intangibles. That's what Plato taught us are the most important. There is so much more to life than simply what is before us in the material. So we've heard about a lot of this today when we talk about these things, the intangibles and their value. What I would suggest to you today is that emerging before us in this age is the Hegelian dialectic, the antithesis. Struggling to find its voice is a new way of seeing reality and a new way of proposing business. A way of proposing business that holds up as important Plato's intangibles 
and sets them as guiding principles of how business ought to be run. In his book, Spirit of Leadership, the Jesuit, Father Robert Spitzer, points out that the intangibles of spirit, vision, and trust are worthy of our investment. Organizations that invest in spirit, vision, and trust are capable of much greater depths of creativity and adaptability, the very things that we need to survive in the ages to come. When we take spirit, vision, and trust and translate that into a tangible way of seeing things, we turn ourselves to John Elkington's book, Cannibals with Forks, where he proposes the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit. This gets past looking at the business as being only there to generate profits for ownership. What Elkington says is that businesses need to focus on also creating planet value by lowering their negative environmental impacts. They need to invest in the dignity of the human person within the organization and within the communities in which they operate and thereby create social capital. This is the triple bottom line. Now we began with talking about how it is such an abstraction that this idea of sustainability, this idea of looking at business beyond simply profitability. What I want to talk about now is where it meets the road. And I want to hold up as a, a great example, Cascade Engineering, which was founded by Fred Keller. They're on the west side of the state in Grand Rapids. It is a wonderful example of how the triple bottom line is manifest in a business. Cascade Engineering is a more than $300 million a year supplier in the automobile business. And when, when Fred Keller started and founded the business back in the early part of the 70s, about the same time that Milton Friedman was writing his article, he knew then that business was much more than simply generating profits for ownership. And what Cascade Engineering has done to create sustainability with triple bottom line value is, is an incredible thing. So I will leave you with that. I will show you that we've given you a tangible example. We'd go study this. That, that businesses that look beyond simply the single bottom line of profitability and work on developing and investing in spirit, vision, and trust are the sort of businesses that realize that creating value goes beyond profitability. It goes into the triple bottom line. And the very good example of that is Cascade Engineering out on the west side of the state in Grand Rapids. So thank you so much for your time.